We've done a couple of videos on binary search. Big fan, right? You know, it's great. It has some pros and cons. One of the pros is that lookups are very fast. One of the cons is that you have to sort the data. And there are lots of other data structures available to us that we could use that serve slightly different purposes. And again, they have pros and cons as well. So today, we're going to start looking at hash maps or hash sets, depending on how you're using them, which are a very different way of storing your data, but they're very, very popular. So for example, if you've used Python, the dictionary is implemented as a hash map. Almost all languages will have a data structure that does, or multiple data structures that does something like this because of the benefits that they have for storing data and looking up very, very quickly. So let's think about, about the speed of binary search. Let's put aside the fact that we had to sort the data. That was a bit of a pain. It takes a long time. But once the data is sorted, the lookup, if you remember, is O log n. So it's log. That's how it scales, right? Yeah, that's how it scales. So if your size of your data is n, if your list doubles in size, your log 2 of n only goes up by 1, right? which basically means you have to do one additional lookup, which is of, of no real concern right, for most computers. So it means that it scales very, very well with the size of your data. Now, that log 2 of n is good, right? What's better is log is O1, right? O1 says, it doesn't mean that you only have to do one operation, right? That's, a, I think, a common misconception. It, it just means that there is no relationship between the speed of lookup, really, and the number of elements in your list. So if your list is 100 elements or 1,000 elements, it's still just the same amount of computation you have to do to do that lookup, right? So O1 is obviously the ideal case, and there are some data structures that offer you this. You'd think, well, why would you use binary search then? Well, each of these have their pros and cons, but I just wanted to talk about hash sets today, or hash maps, because they are one of these data structures, right? And they are very, very popular. What is a hash? We've talked about cryptographic hashes before. The hash function takes some string, right? Let's say A, B, C, and it turns it into some fixed length string, but it's not usually three long. These sort of hashes that we're looking at today are a little bit different. They are a numerical code that represents some object in memory that we're trying to put into our data structure. So a hash set is essentially a large list of numbers indexed by their hash rather than by themselves. So you might have a very large list of numbers, right? And this is zero, and this is one, and this is two, and this is three, dot, 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 all the way up to the maximum size of your set. So let's say 10,000, right? So I'm gonna do nine, 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 nine here. Now, I nearly made a mistake. So now these are not your actual values. These are the hashes of those values. So you have, let's say you have a string or you have a, an object or a class or you have a number, you hash it into here and it comes out as four and then you can put your object in here, right? And then you have object two comes along and you, get, you compute a hash on it and, it and it comes up as 770. So down here somewhere you have this object you know, with 770 as its hash. Let's talk about how this hash is calculated. If you have an integer, right, and you want your hash to also be an integer, then there is no, there's nothing to do, right? You, the, the hash is the number, okay, that works well. If you have something, for example, if you're trying to return a 32-bit hash value, and you've got a 64-bit number, then what you would commonly do is take the two halves and XOR them together. And then for a string, you have to do a computation that combines each of the characters for every position in the string, for example. And so the more complicated your object, perhaps, the more complicated the hash is. We're gonna look at integers today, just because for, for, for simplicity. But it, it, these are usually quite fast, and they're not, they don't have to be cryptographically secure, right? But the same restrictions that we've talked about previously on, on you know, cryptographic hashes, they don't hold here. What we're looking for here is a broadly good distribution of our values around this list. So it's a bit of a way of kind of like boiling it down or abbreviating yes, it. Yes, it's like a sort of fingerprint, yes, but very, very simplistic one. We'll talk about what happens when two objects have the same hash in a moment, but you're not absolutely concerned about that, right? It does, it's going to happen. I mean, the thing to think about is if we've got our list of numbers here that's only 10,000 long and we've got 12,000 different objects, if we find a way of hashing them into this list of 10,000 numbers, by definition, some of them are going to have the same hash. Right? Um, and in fact, this is what we would normally do. So normally your hash set would have a capacity, right? in this case, 10,000. And so we actually calculate that the actual hash lookup value right, is gonna be the hash of our integer, a hash of i, which is gonna be itself or some other complicated way of doing it, mod, remember mod, yeah, it's come back, 
mod our capacity, which I'm just going to write C, right, like this. So mod 10,000 or something like this. And this means that if your number is 12,000, it's going to loop back around to be 2,000 on this set. And it also means that broadly speaking, as long as your original hashes are, are fairly uniform in their distribution, their positions on this are also going to be fairly uniform. Right? And that avoids too many, too many values clumping around zero, for example, and no one, no, nothing at four. Right? That's the idea. So how do we deal with collisions? Because that will happen. Right? And if you have a... Imagine, so collisions where two things boil down yeah. to be the same. So imagine that you had a capacity that was equal to the number of possible values you could have, and you had a hashing function but always gave unique values, then we wouldn't have any collisions, right? Because they'd all just go into, you know, into the correct place and that would be fine. That is unlikely to happen because, you know, there's issues of memory, for example. We want to put 1.2 billion items into our set. You might not have a maximum capacity of one point. You might, but in, even then, your hash function might not be perfect. And, you know, for strings and things, might produce the same hash for some complicated strings. So we're going to get some collisions. So what do you do? Well, it, this is what you do when you, when you insert something into this, you say, okay, what, what is the hash of this value mod C? So let's say that that gives us a value of four, right? So we come in here and we look, oh, hang on a minute, there's already something in the four. So what we do is we create a little list at this, at this position where we have object two, right? You see like this. Now, this list is a slower data structure because we're doing that linear search, but it's only got two objects in it. So this is much, much faster. So we have another object object four that's coming up this time and maybe it has a hash of two so we put in a new one and that's fine object in here and then we have another one so this gets appended onto here object two i'm giving them all the same names my naming convention is rubbish you just hold lots of little lists at each of these indices such that anything that has the same hash just gets put into this short list into if your hash function is good and so everything is, is, is reasonably well distributed, then you'll find that you have roughly the same number in each bucket. That's kind of the idea. Right? Now, what's the speed of lookup of this? Well, in the best case, it's 01, because you say, okay, is 17 in the data set? You hash it, it comes out as 17, let's say. You look, and there is always not an object there, and it's, it, so you're, you're done. That's all you have to do. In a slightly worse case, you have a short list that you have to look through, right? In the, in the absolute worst case, you have all of the items have received the same hash, and so you have literally a list of length n here, right? So in a sense, the best case scenario for a hash set is 01, and the worst case is on, but you rarely see on, right? If you've given any thought to your design, right, at all, okay? And so, and it doesn't tend to happen. If, if you are looking for the hash 17, why is that? quicker than looking for 17 in, say, an array. Like. It's, it's not, right? And that's, that's really interesting. So one of the downsides of a hash set is it, there is a bit of memory and a bit of computational overhead. This 01, in some sense, is ever so slightly worse than the 01 array lookup that you would do where you just index at 17. But for that to work, you would have to know that you were only ever going to see indices that were numbers and were between these two values, right? So it might be that you have that exact situation, right? You know you're only going to have one between, a number between zero and 10,000, and so, and you're never going to have duplicates, and you're never going to have collisions, so just have an array, right? You don't need to use a hash set. You don't need to use a, a dictionary in Python to do that, which is why we have lists. So, again, it comes back to that idea of, think a little bit about why you're using a specific data structure, right? Just because you can have a list of keys like this and, and associated values or not, doesn't mean you just necessarily have to. Right. And so um, indexing just straight off using a number is always going to be the fastest way of doing it. I've had a go implementing this in Python. Let's have a look. So I implemented this as a short class. Now, of course, you'd be ill-advised to use this class, right? Because there's a perfectly good set in Python, right? Which is called a set. And you can use that. And it implements this, but mostly in C, and it's much, much faster. So definitely use that. Um, Let's just draw a brief distinction between the two types. A hash set is one where you store only the numbers and you're essentially trying to work out what's in there and what's not in there. And you can do things, you can do standard set notation things from mathematics. So for example, intersection of sets, the union of sets and things like this. Um, this was for a long time in Python implemented literally as a dictionary. Um, it's just that you never used for values. A dictionary is where you have your set of keys, which are this hash map, and then they link to something that has a value. Right? Like an index in a book. It is. So your hashes are your index into your element, right? So a set doesn't have the actual element, it just has the indices, right? They 
they are both implemented often in very, very similar ways because they're essentially the same data structure. It's just one of them then has a pointer to something else. And perhaps we can look at extending this to dictionaries in a different video. I've partially implemented a class here called hashset. It has a capacity, which is the essentially the size of the underlying data structure that we're using, which is a, which is a list. And I initialize that data to have nothing in it, right? So just be a long list of nothing where when we start to put elements in, we can create a little entry there. And then there's really only a few functions we have to implement. I'm not implementing most of the set functions because you know I've, I've got other things to do, but there's an, you want to be able to add an item. Ideally, you want to be able to remove an item, although I haven't implemented this. And you want to use the contains function to be able to use the in keyword. So remember, when we were doing binary search, we, all, we tested against um, whether something was in, 17 was in our list. We'll be able to do that on this set. We'll be able to say, is 17 in our set? So how do we implement this? Well, actually, there's very little code involved. Python implements an underlying hash function that you can use rather than writing your own every time. Right? You could write your own if you, were very, if you had a specific data structure you were very worried about and you wanted maximum speed. Um, in Python, the hash of an integer is just the integer. We knew, we knew this. A hash of a string will be calculated in a different way, but will still give you a number. Right? It could be very large and it could be positive or negative but it will be a number. In this case, we're only really looking at integers for the sake of simplicity. So at the beginning of add, I'm going to have our integer i that I'm trying to add into our hash set. We're going to create the hash of i, and then we're going to call h mod the capacity of our data so that we can run this on a very small hash set with very few bins or a very large hash set with lots and lots of bins. And then actually deciding whether something's already in the data is quite easy. We look up the data element at the correct index, which is given by hash, our hash mod the capacity. And then we say, if it's not none, which means that there's already something in there, we append it to the list that's in there and we add it onto the list. If it is none, we just create a new little list at that location with our single item in it. And then really the contains function is exactly the same. So in Python, if you implement this underscore underscore contains function, what you're doing is, is allowing it to use the in keyword, essentially. And so we're going to say, okay, we're going to create our hash in the exact same way. We're going to, again, calculate the modulo so that we are within our capacity limit. And then we just say, okay, is the data at that location none? If it's not, can we find our value we're looking for in that little list? Right? And hopefully that list isn't too long. So we can just use the in keyword, which will just be a little linear search, but it won't take too long. There are better ways to implement hash maps, right? than this. This is a demonstration of a kind of minimum bare bones implementation that does work, right? at least as far as I know. I've also written a print function so I can see what's in, this, in, the, uh, in the set. So let's test it out. Right? So I'm going to run Python, I map.py. Okay, we're in Python and we have our hash set now. So we're going to create a new one. How many elements do we want to test it with? Same numbers again or slightly fewer just for to save ourselves yeah, some time? Let's, All right, uh, let's so reduce. Let's say our hash set h is equal to a hash set with a maximum size of let's say a million elements right what does this mean well it means that our underlying data structure is only a million in size it doesn't mean we can only store a million elements because some of them just might have the same hash right um, you could really store as many elements as you want but of course the more you store beyond your capacity the more you more collisions you're going to have the slower it will get right so Let's create now our random integer array of, um, in fact, let's, let's just do our numbers like we did before. Right? So that's much, much easier. So let's say we have our list, which is equal to i for i in range. And then let's say we're going to put 10 million in there, right? So that means we're going to have around 10 in each of our bins, right? Which means a short linear search for a lookup, but not anything like a linear search across, across 10 million elements. So if I look at, if I look at list, first 10 items, then you have naught to nine. So now we can see, we can add all these items into our hash set, right? Which is a little bit of a slow process, but shouldn't be too bad. So we can say for uh, integer in uh, list, h dot add i. And it's just gonna go off and do that. By the way, if you use the actual Python set, it's much, much faster, right? It's faster because it has finished now, just, just not that, it's not that bad. It's faster because this should be done in low level C code, right? What I'm doing is a lot of intermediate Python code, checking variables, going back to C, coming back again. There's a lot of waiting around for things to happen. Okay, so now we can see if 17 is in our hash set. So we can say 17 in H and it says true, 
right? And that works, and it worked really, really quickly, even though we've got a, a 10 million value. So we can find, is another one in there, so we could say, you know, 999,999 in H, it is. Now, if we take that out of a list, just like we, you know, we've done before, so we could say, okay, so LS, uh, so hash, I can't take it out of a list because I didn't, I didn't implement the remove function, did I? Uh. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, let's just implement it quickly now. Uh, you can speed fast forward this bit. Um, it's going to be exactly the same as our insert function, except we're going to delete it instead. Um, in H, yeah, okay. So I've, I've, I've now added a remove function. This will teach me to be lazy. Um, where it is very, very similar to the add function, except instead of a, um, appending a new item to a list, we're going to remove it from that list if it's there, okay? So now let's test this out. So we, we know that 999999 is in uh, H, so let's now remove it from H. H.remove, right, that seems to have done something. So now can we say uh, 999999 in H, false, right? And actually, if we look at the data structure, we can see that. So if we go, um, if we do hash of 999999, it should be the same number again, because we already said that hashes in Python just return a number for an integer. So now let's look at our data structure at that location. So if we look at the, what, what we'll find is we'll find all the numbers that modulo the capacity are the same, right, are 999999. So let's have a quick look. So if we go h dot data at nine, one shouldn't normally look at the internals of a data structure like this, but sometimes it's useful for learning. You can see we've got 1,999,999. We also have 2,999,999. All the increments of a million, right, on this value, okay? Except for 999,999, which we removed. And I'm now wishing I picked a shorter number to say, but anyway. So a hash set is, a, is an extremely useful um, data structure right so in python using a set will allow you to very quickly find what numbers are in what lists finding the numbers that are common between two lists and things like this is extremely useful perhaps the extended version is the one you see most of all which is the dictionary right so in a dictionary we now add to these indices we add an actual item that we can add so you have key value pairs and this hash map is perhaps something to look at next time Global trading firm and computer file supporter Jane Street have made a little puzzle for us all. Here it is, it involves placing numbers in this Manhattan grid representing skyscrapers. And you've got to figure out what heights of skyscrapers block other ones. Does it look like something you could crack? Now the puzzle's just for fun, but it is aimed at drawing a bit of attention to Jane Street's summer AMP event, which is going to be in New York. That's the Academy of Math and Programming. Now this is something for recent high school graduates to come to New York and immerse themselves in things like game theory, programming, data analysis, all that good stuff. And it's aimed at opening doors to students who perhaps have faced barriers to getting advanced STEM education opportunities like this. It's an amazing program and it's a very generous opportunity. There are more details in the video description. It's well worth a look. Oh, and by the way, you don't have to complete the skyscraper puzzle to apply. That's just something they've made for fun. And you can do the puzzle, even if you're not interested in the AMP thing. If you want to find out more, there's going to be links in all the usual places. You know, the video description, comments, things you can click on. Check it out. And thanks to Jane Street for supporting this episode.